It's my great pleasure, and in particular, it's an honor to be here for the first meeting of this country. And I would like to thank, again, Dr. Hanna and Professor Badawi for this invitation. And as you see, my title is a little bit specific, and also particular, because in this presentation, I'll be trying to tell you how is the situation when you are in front of such patients? So what you should think, how you should think, and how difficult sometimes is to take a decision, but in particular, how difficult sometimes is to make a diagnosis in order to be able to start a treatment. And so I will try to give you definitions. I will try to give you classification. And before we enter, the world of mixed connective tissue diseases, I had to introduce you to what is the concept of overlap syndromes, and I will present you even something new that is called translational syndromes. So here you see the definition. The definition is actually very simple. We are talking about diseases where different signs and symptoms overlap. Then you have something not easy. This seems very easy to say here, but in reality, when you are in front of the patient, it is not easy at all. So when I say systemic sclerosis plus polymyositis, and you see here the characteristic classic renal phenomenon, sclerodactyly, interstitial lung disease, and calcinosis, but the presence of myositis is really challenging you because the patient comes to you and says, you know what, I am so weak. My hands, I cannot lift my hands. When I sit down, it's so difficult to stand. Now, the problem is that you have to make a differential diagnosis between myopathy and myositis. Because this differential diagnosis is fundamental for the choice of the treatment. And so that's the reason why you have to work on this area and try to demonstrate that this patient has a myositis so it has a meaningful inflammatory component that is affecting the muscle and it is not only a simple myopathy depending on malabsorption or sometimes, unfortunately, depending on steroid abuse in this kind of patient. I followed this patient in years and then abruptly after, and, 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 and the, at the end of the 90s, she started to change and you see here that she became a scleroderma patient. But what happened that in 2011, she is starting to add anti-CCP, and in particular, she started to have an active senoitis, not an arthropathy, but an active senoitis. So she's moving, actually, to the third disease. She started lupus, then she left lupus, she became scleroderma, now she's leaving scleroderma, and she's going to have a the most important involvement of the joints. So you know, we are at this point, we know that sometimes these diseases, these diseases do not overlap, but however, they follow one after the other. Now, let me just go over to this point. Um, when we are in our practice again, it happens many times that we don't know how to classify this patient. And that's the reason why we have symptoms of different um, connective tissue diseases, but we are not able to position this patient precisely in a box. That's the reason why we employ this term that has been coined by my late mentor, Caroline Roy, of undifferentiated connective tissue diseases. So what we do? We just classify the patient as something we don't know, and at this point, we are waiting to see where they are going. But however, sometimes we know that there is a distinct entity that is called mixed connective tissue diseases 
that is characterized not only by a precise clinical feature, but also is characterized by a specific antibody that is the anti-RNP antibody. Now, if you look at this chart, you see that when I told you, sorry, when I told you that we are waiting, when you have UCTD, obviously you are waiting the patient to evolve in the lupus world or in the scleroderma world. And when you see MCTD, in reality you are waiting for them to go also somewhere else, like in lupus or in scleroderma. And when you compare MCTD versus UCTD, you see that there are some characteristics that are common, but after five years, there is a change, obviously, in the, in the pattern. And the question is now, if UCTD is a limbo where we don't know where the patient will go, what is really MCTD? So I will challenge you now, because when I was younger, I thought MCTD does not exist. You know, we are just thinking that MCTD is something that um, it's real, but in reality is already in some different diseases like lupus, like scleroderma, like myositis, like rheumatoid, but in reality is not a distinct entity. And you see here which are the pros and cons to consider MCTD as a distinct clinical entity. So you see pros, obviously, the specific antibody that you can find mainly and only in this disease. Then the association with DR4, then the response, excellent response to corticosteroids, and also a better prognosis. Actually, I have to tell you, number six, as well as was said in 2006, is absolutely false. Because we know there are patients that don't have a better prognosis. They go downhill very rapidly and very abruptly in the, in the, in the course of the disease. Then, contrary, uh, we know that this antibody can appear also in lupus or in other diseases. Um, the link to DR4 is, is weak because we know that it may be linked also to rheumatoid. Then, uh, obviously, from the very first beginning, you have clinical features that are from scleroderma, from, from uh, antisynthetase syndrome, from the overlap of PML and, and scleroderma syndrome and of lupus, and uh, obviously, this is a specific steroids. Yes, they work very well, but sometimes they don't work because the patient has some characteristic where steroids are absolutely worthless. So we know that we have criteria today. I mean, you can choose this and this, probably this, you will see is a little bit more sensitive, but you have criteria to classify the disease. And the question is the evolution. So the question was, does misconnected tissue diseases is preparing the patient to something else, or he will remain misconnected tissue disease in time? And so you have here an answer, you have here three um, three section in time, so zero to five years, from five to ten, and more than ten years. And you see that criteria of Kazukawa, Alarcon, are those who better perform here in, in inside the years. And here is the evolution. And you see immediately that the antibodies is setting the scene. And you see that when you have anti-DNA antibodies, the evolution to SLE is fairly significant. So you know that when you have a patient that you classify as MCTD, characterized by renal phenomenon, a mild arthritis, and with the antibodies, ANA, RNP, and already double-stranded DNA, you know that this patient has a high risk to be a, DNA, a lupus patient. However, what is important for scleroderma? And you see here that this is evident. If the patient already has scleroderma, this patient is not 
makes connective tissue disease. This patient is already a scleroderma patient. In fact, you see here, this is 54%, and here you have 85% if to sclerodactyly you, you, you add hypermotility and dilatation of the esophagus. So you know that these two signs, sclerodactyly and hypermotility, are driving you immediately to the diagnosis of scleroderma. And you see also that antibodies again are important. And this ENA antibody like ESM is absolutely important when you have renal involvement and is a predictor of organ involvement. So when you have ANA, you have RNP, you may have obviously DNA, DNA antibodies. And then you have SM, you know that renal involvement may be the next step. On the other side, you have here the neurological involvement. And this somehow was a surprise, because we do not expect that SSA antibodies or rho antibodies, that usually you know characterize Shagrin, could be linked to neurological involvement. But this was the result we had observed. And again, scleroderma sent. When you already have ANA, RNP, and top isomerase 1 scleroderma 70, you know that this will be linked to hypermotility and dilation of esophagus that with scleroderma will lead you immediately to scleroderma. On the other side, this is something impressive. I have to tell you why. Because when we deal with Shagrin syndrome usually, and we have SSA antibodies, we don't look at the, at the lung. But I can tell you that revising the charts, we have seen and demonstrated clearly that the anti-SSA antibody is not only linked to the neurological involvement, it's also in particular linked to the pulmonary involvement. And in this patient, the interstitial lung disease is very fast and dreadful. Here, you see antibodies predictor of scleroderma, as well as the top isomerism one, scleroderma 70, was predicted of hypermotility. The anti-centromere um, antibody is predictor of scleroderma. So again, you enter in the world of scleroderma. On the other side, the anti-DNA antibodies, together with the SSA antibody, DNA antibody, is linked to the pleuritis and pericarditis. So in conclusion, what can I tell you? Looking at this data. In reality, misconnected tissue disease, we have seen, <coughs> evolved. But the part of this patient do not evolve. They remain with connective tissue disease. So I know I, 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 when I, we started this investigation, I really was convinced of the opposite. But more than 10 years later, we can say that 30-40% of the patient keep their position and still remain what we call today mixed connective tissue disease. So the older the older statement that we rheumatologists, in particular those that was a we're saying, you know, misconnected tissue, tissue disease uh, would buy to this law. In reality, it was a mistake. Because we know that there are patients that will remain MCTD in their evolution and will not evolve to other diseases. However, we know that there are approximately 30-40% that will evolve to another disease. So it's our duty to understand this and to be able to predict where they will go because the choice of the treatment will change. So this means that we cannot treat them all as MCTD. We have to treat them all already where they are going. So if it's scleroderma direction, you have to treat them for scleroderma. If it's lupus, you have to treat them for lupus. Don't wait. Don't wait. Why don't wait? Because nephritis in the scleroderma world, but even worse, in the scleroderma world, Pulmonary arterial hypertension is striking incredibly this patient, MCTD patient, that are characterized by the presence of topoisomerase or centromere antibodies. So don't wait. Please don't wait. Treat them as they are, as they would be a scleroderma or they would be a lupus patient. And then in conclusion, we think that the Kazukawa classification criteria are probably the more sensitive. And in conclusion, I want to uh, thank all the centers that have participated throughout Europe. And sorry for this. Uh, I don't know what does it mean, but it should be my my, my department. Uh, and also this, uh, um, 
Okay, these guys here are those involved, definitely Tzipi, uh, but <laughs> uh, their name are in the in the, in the bulk of my co-workers in my department, and I have to tell you that without their support, I could not be here with you, telling all these things that I hope will be interesting for you. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mark, for very interesting presentation about immunoconversion, which you are seeing more common now. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, the floor is open for discussion. I think we can go with five minutes for discussion. So any questions? Thank you very much, Mark. But I think, do we have any predictors how the patients, we why will. any driven factors, why they change from one disease pattern? I know it's, it's something to do with the whole setup of uh, the effective uh, immunity and autoimmune and induction. Can we predict which patient will convert or we don't have any predictions? No, we, uh, I, I really don't know. I don't have a clue about that. Um, the, the secret in, I mean, it's not, it's not, my answer is not really very scientific, but however, it's reality. Um, the secret is to follow up the patient. The secret is to follow up the patient because he will come to you and he will tell you, no, I have this, and you have to investigate. This patient came to me and said, I have renal phenomenon. I said, what the hell? No, you have renal phenomenon. Why? So I started to investigate. Then he came and said, you know why? My, my, my wrists are swollen. I said, my God. So ultrasound immediately, uh, power doctor, um, thickness of the of the of the synovium and and, and uh, erosion of the synovium with the power doctor. So, and then rheumatoid factor popping up and CCP popping up. So I understand it's changing. So the best thing I can tell you as a doctor is follow your patients and listen to them because they will tell you what's going on. What I have to say in mixed connective tissue disease, what is really concerning me is how can I predict that this patient will develop pulmonary arterial hypertension. And this is probably one of the biggest challenges we have today because we are not really able to find anything that can predict us that this patient will make and will unfortunately develop this terrible complication. Any more questions? Thank you very much, Mark. Very Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.